Okay, welcome, bienvenidos to today's core peer learning circle, a part of a series about evaluation. Today, we're going to talk about data collection and analysis. These peer learning circles are different, are a different format from usual core coffee chats. They're more of a conversation where we can all share tips and learn from each other. My name is Crystal Caballero, and I'm joined today by Jane Conklin. We're part of the consulting team, along with Nicole Young and Nicole, Nicole Lezen, who support a countywide initiative called Collective of Results and Evidence-Based, or CORE, Investments, and will be your host today. We're joined by our colleagues, Oscar Rios, who will provide simultaneous interpretation, and Gisela Carrasco, who's providing consecutive interpretation and translation in the chat. We'll start with a brief overview of CORE. So in case anyone is new, um, CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, and it's a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. CORE has evolved over several years based on input and insights gathered from many partners and local government, philanthropy, nonprofits, and community groups. And this collaborative process has led to the core mission and vision with equity at the center. And when we say equitable health and well-being, we mean that all people across the lifespan have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well-being. And that people's opportunities and life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by their race, ethnicity, income, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, or any other social identity. So both as a funding model and a movement, CORE provides a framework to help us align priorities, programs, policies, funding, and results around community-wide goals to create the core conditions for health and well-being. Equity is at the center of this diagram to illustrate that we have to examine and address our individual organizational and systemic beliefs, practices, and structures that perpetuate the very inequities we're determined to eliminate. Events like today's peer learning circle are offered as a part of the core Institute for Innovation and Impact. So think of this core institute as the learning arm of core investments, offering um, a variety of training, technical assistance, and other learning opportunities for people across sectors to build the knowledge, skills, and systems needed to fulfill our collective vision of an equitable, thriving, and resilient community. And with that, I'll pass it to Jane Conklin to lead us through our time today to discuss data collection and analysis. Hey, good morning, everybody. I am so excited to be here. Um, I am an independent consultant and about half of my practice is in evaluation and I do some other kinds of work as well. And I've had evaluation in one form or another throughout my career, whether I was working with nonprofits or the state health department or community foundation. And I just really enjoy thinking about it, talking about it. Um, and so I'm pleased to be here with Crystal and Oscar and Gisela and everyone who joined today so we can um, just learn together. And so I wanted to just start us off with a little bit of a context frame and then maybe just open up the conversation to things people are interested in. And so, um, you know, I feel as if evaluation is one of those things. There's lots of information swirling about, there's lots of definitions, but I chose this one. This is um, offered by Better Evaluation, um, which is a great resource for lots of evaluation information. But essentially, this definition, basically, it's any systematic, and so that idea of it's intentional, it's a process, any systematic process to judge merit, worth, or significance by combining evidence and values. And I think, um, especially in the context of an initiative like CORE, it's really nice to make transparent that idea of values um, in the evaluation. And so, you know, explicitly acknowledging that. So, you know, it can be built into our evaluation and processes like how we engage stakeholders or how we frame program outcomes 
or the evaluation questions, how we're collecting data, and indeed what we count as evidence and how we interpret and share results. So I think that is a really nice frame um, for it's one, again, of many definitions of evaluation, but I wanted to center us here um, in this idea of being systematic and then also thinking about merit, worth, or our pro and significance of our programs. Um, the next slide. And then the other thing that I'm just gonna offer to start us out with is, um, this idea of a framework for evaluation. So that, again, there are many different frameworks out there in the world. Um, and, you know, I will confess earlier in my career when I approached evaluation, it was much more intuitive or just building off things that had already been done by predecessors in the agencies where I worked. Um, and as I got deeper into thinking about and practicing evaluation, I found that having a structured approach in some ways was really helpful to kind of making that evaluation more manageable and getting some more actionable um, targeted answers. So not necessarily formal, but just kind of thinking through maybe the steps or the cycle of an evaluation, if you will. And so the framework here is one that was developed by CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And it was um, designed for uh, public health program evaluation, but it's really flexible and scalable to any context. And so I'm just gonna go through this briefly and then we'll dive in to talk about whatever people are interested in talking about. Um, when we first framed these pure learning circles, we broke evaluation into three sections, kind of planning. We did a, a circle earlier uh, last month and then data collection and then data use. But really, I think the conversation can be pretty free form um, wherever our interests take us. But um, just to kind of walk through this quickly. So these first steps, kind of engaging stakeholders, describing the program and focusing design are all part of the planning process. So in terms of stakeholder engagement, sometimes we can think about engaging those key stakeholders who are perhaps the individuals who are the primary users of the evaluation findings, people who are gonna make decisions based on what's learned through evaluation, um, individuals who are implementing the program, as well as program participants um, and people otherwise affected by our programs. And although stakeholder engagement here is pictured as a first step, it really can continue throughout the cycle, uh, the life cycle of an evaluation. The second step in this framework is really describing the program. Um, and this is essentially getting clarity and consensus on what it is that you're evaluating. You know, it's understanding things like what are all the different program components? How is the program supposed to work? And what the intended outcomes are. And in this step, you might want to develop a logic model or a theory of change. Um, identify what your program goals are and um, clarify any key constructs that are in your evaluation. And finally, in evaluation planning is that third step, focusing the evaluation design. So what are your priority evaluation questions? What do you really want to learn from this evaluation? And then what are the data collections that you're going to use to best answer those questions, your timelines for developing your tools, collecting data, analyzing it and reporting it. Um, and so then the next phase, after you've done all your planning, are the next two pieces of gathering credible evidence and justifying your conclusions. And that's kind of where we thought to frame today's discussion. But as I said before, anything that strikes the fancy of this group, we can talk about. Um, but in this phase, it's really um, often what we think of evaluation as, you know, going out and collecting and gathering data, analyzing that data um, to come up with some conclusions. And then that final stage, sharing information and ensuring that the lessons loosed, uh, lessons learned are used. So that's kind of the big picture framework um, in thinking about the life cycle of an evaluation. And I wanted to pause here and get um, any feedback on that or ideas from um, people in the group about questions or interests they have in today's discussion. Peggy. Yes, good morning, Jane. Would you unpack credible evidence a little bit? Sure. So the idea of credibility in evidence is um, 
you know, that, that you're, you're trying to collect data that is going to be, um, information that people have confidence in, right. That they feel like is, is, is complete, is collected without bias, that the stakeholders, the people that are making the decisions have some confidence that the information you've gathered is really responding to those evaluation questions. And so evidence collection can be anything from, um, primary uh, data collection, which is data that you've collected specifically for an evaluation. So whether you've designed a survey or you're conducting some focus groups or key informant interviews, individual interviews, things of that nature, sometimes there's all sorts of different evidence or data collection strategies. Some people use photo voice or direct observations out in the community, but all of that evidence might be considered primary because you're going out to gather it. There's also secondary data that you might bring into the picture. So those can be things like um, existing program records that were collected for other pieces, cost information that's at the agency, or it might be external data that might be like census data, or you know, you're lucky in Santa Cruz County to have a wealth of data available through data share. So any of those sort of secondary, they're, they're collected by somebody else for another purpose. You can bring those in and kind of create a more comprehensive picture. So that's that idea of gathering evidence, what you collect, what somebody else collects, and what your stakeholders have confidence in, and you in as evaluator as well. Thank you. So are there other questions or um, that people have today that topics they want to talk about? I have one that someone sent in in advance. Um, and I can get to that one next. Um, and someone asked um, a question about how to incorporate the board into a comprehensive evaluation. And I don't know if that's someone on the call that asked that question and wants to elaborate a little bit more on that. I'll throw one other, I guess, topic, or I don't know if it's necessarily a question or I, I haven't framed it into a question yet. <laughs> um, but, Perfect. Uh, so with Arts Council, you know, currently, I mean, just with our arts education programs alone, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 core programs <laughs> that we have different evaluation tools for and evaluate in different ways based on the programming and the goals. And then that's just Arts Ed. And then we have several other programs as well, organizationally. And so we are currently, and I'm very peripherally in this process at the moment, um, uh, it will all be kind of pulled in soon, but um, we're in the process of looking at all of our evaluation tools organizationally and trying to find a way to kind of streamline and, and mimic pro across program to program what we're capturing and evaluating and trying to let go of some of that peripheral stuff that we're evaluating year after year and really just finding the same results, <laughs> you know, for, for like the last 10 years, say with one of our programs, we get the same results every year with our, you know, post survey. So do we really need to continue to do that? Um, so I guess those are, that those are, that's the topic. And I, I think there is a question in there. I'm just not exactly <laughs> sure what it is yet. That is such a rich meaty to like topic like that's a great topic and so I want to open it up to others on the call has anyone else gone through a similar process or thinking about a similar process get other people's perspectives I always have a lot of like I'm full of opinions but I want to make sure that there's space because this is you know people are are working at organizations and I'm sure that's a, a challenge or a, a goal for many So I think, you know, that I feel like it's interesting because one of the things, especially at the end that you said to me was kind of keying in on this um, idea of 
evaluation results as being actionable. You know, if you have a program that's really stable, you're finding the same things over and over again over time, you know, it, it can be really helpful sometimes to have like confirmation that what you're doing is kind of achieving the goals that you want. Mm -hmm. um, it's also nice to think about, you know, is there something that you're considering, you know, adjusting a program or, uh, you know, are there decisions to be made with the information and are you gathering the right kinds of, are you asking the right kinds of questions and gathering the right kinds of information to really make some decisions or program adjustments based on that? Um, and I think, I think it's also a really interesting idea that, um, you know, sometimes I think with programs that I've worked on, we'll be asking so many questions, you know, like people have lots of information that they want to know, but is it interesting or is it necessary to the program? And thinking about, um, you know, if you're thinking about things to let go of, like, I think that's always kind of that question of, is it something that's, you know, either confirming something that needs confirming, is it actionable? Is it adding to knowledge that you can apply in some other ways? Um, and, and I think, so are you, are you considering like a core set of questions that you ask across programs and then adding specific ones to, to get to specific goals that programs are doing? I mean, I think to a degree, we will still need to have specific questions um, program by program. You know, for example, you know, um, our Mari Posa Arts program where we're working with high school students and training them in an art form and then in how to teach that art form. And there's a mentorship relationship there. You know, in that case, that, that's actually the one I was referring to where year after year after year, we get the same results. <laughs> it's always, you know, around 80, between 80 and 100% are happy with the program, feel like they've, you know, learned, um, gotten more comfortable speaking in front of people, you know, have a, a positive relationship with an, a caring adult throughout the year, you know, all of these things that they are reporting. But when you were speaking, I'm realizing, well, yeah, I think those are still things we still want to confirm, you know, because if we do, if it does end up going down for some reason, or somebody, you know, if it does score low, then that is something we would want to look at and address. And that doesn't relate to anything else organizationally. So I do feel like we still will need to have specific. I think you kind of answered some of, some of that question that, it was, that was somewhere in there. You know, I, I think we do still need to have some separate tools. Um, I think we were thinking about as far as streamlining um, evaluation, I think it was probably a little bit more around equity organizationally, like who are we serving? Um, who are we engaging in different aspects of our work, um, things like that, you know, around like grantees and teaching artists and artists that are involved um, across the county. So I'm, I think th that's it, streamlining those kinds of tools that can be overlaid organizationally and then us still having our own separate um, programmatic and, and, and you know, con quality continuation kinds of tools. <laughs> yeah, you know, and in some ways that makes me think of to that, um, even kind of backing up into that, um, describing the program um, idea is, you know, as we organizationally or individual programs start to think about sort of shifting our focus, you know, like this idea particularly of, um, equity. And I was working with an organization that was like, we want to raise community voice in a particular way, but they didn't necessarily, it was kind of this emergent idea, but they hadn't necessarily fully embedded it either in like the ways in which like program tools had been adjusted or the ways program goals had been adjusted. And so they were doing um, some playing with like the smarty goals. So a smart goal that adds um, equity and inclusion to it. And I think that's really important, you know, as we think about our outcomes or what we want to achieve and making sure that our programs are designed in such a way that they, that that through line is included in program activities in what we intend as our outcomes. And especially like you're at this really amazing vantage point of thinking organizationally. And so how to kind of like those missions and value driven pieces show up in those individual program models and then outcomes and just kind of pulling that thread all the way through. Because I think sometimes we have uh, expectations for our programs that aren't necessarily built into the programs themselves. And so kind of making sure that, you know, if we have those intended outcomes that we're kind of 
it's well communicated to all the the program planners and you know and that they they're wanted. and deliverers all the whole thing so um we have a nice um there's a padlet that we'll share but there's a smarty goals uh resource that we've included and they have a bank of smarty goals that you can link to because sometimes it's really nice to see how other people have framed that especially when we're trying to change how we use language or frame goals so that'll be i think it's I think it's at the end of this slide set. If not, it's in the Padlet that we've linked, but I've kind of been digging around in there because it's it's a little bit new for me to write goals in that way. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Jane, I was wondering, listening to both you and Sarah, when, when Sarah describes something, a program that's been well evaluated or a positive uh, outcome for years, is it dangerous to start train changing the questions you know, I'm thinking about when you get surveys and it's the same organization or the same thing and you just become like an automat and just click, 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 you know. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. And again, I always want to open it up to others before I just dive in. <laughs> Have other people experimented with changing questions and found benefits or pros or cons to doing that? I mean, I definitely, in, in the past, it's been a couple, well, last year we did add on two questions, but we still had all of the other questions because yeah. we didn't want to lose. We wanted to make sure, you know, that those things were still happening. So we did add on some questions around their social justice art projects that they're working on because we wanted to see um, the impact of, of this kind of new, new piece. Um, mm -hmm. But in, in the past, we have shifted some of the questions around, you know, we've like let go of questions and let go of, you know, some of the more art skill building questions and things like that, because our focus has really been more social emotional anyway. Um, and, you know, I, I think there is a benefit to having that through line or having that, you know, the on the, the repeated questions because mm -hmm. you can see change over time, whether mm -hmm. it's better or worse or, you know, um, but and then you kind of lose you lose that when you do change too many questions, I guess. Yeah, fair point. Fair point. The other thing I thought of listening to you was, and I'm sure you do this, you know, if you have answers that are less than positive, you know, in a couple of years or things that people want to change or, you know, I'm sure you then incorporate that into a, a new question or a way to to see if that change has um, resonated with yes. with participants yeah I was thinking of that listening to oh you. you just gave me an idea oh, <laughs> you actually <laughs> no because we about about two years ago this is our second year now where we've had high school students actually sit on our arts ed committee which is like a yeah. strategic oversight committee that has adult professionals and you know we meet monthly to program plan and and set goals and and that stuff and I've never asked them a question about their participants, you know, there's been two or three that have been involved now for two years. And that's not, that would be something interesting to measure or to ask about or to, yeah, assess. so thank you. <laughs> that just made me think of that. My pleasure. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think Peggy, that's a great question, you know, that sort of, well, there's, there's, again, there's all these nuances to it, because I think some things, it is nice to kind of keep some continuity over time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you get a question that's kind of in a way been internally validated, like you under, like pe your participants understand it, the language seems clear, um, mm -hmm. you know, those pieces. And, and again, to Sarah's point of, you can see like, are there changes over time? Um, so there are sometimes like, I feel like as evaluators, like we're like, oh, I want to do something dynamic and new. And, <laughs> and, and then you're like, oh, but this is such a good question. And it gives us really solid information. And, you know, the other reality is sometimes, you know, funders have particular areas of interest, or it's a good selling point to our program to say, yeah, 80 to 90% of our students, you know, have demonstrated these kinds of skills after participating in our program. And that's, you know, because that's a solid performance, <laughs> doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with that either, you know, but, but that, that can be a good thing. Um, but the other thing that I think is, is really nice, and this is kind of the evaluation use piece, is kind of making sure that we follow up that what we've found that we want to make adjustments actually gets adjusted. And then we kind of quality assure that in the program to make sure those changes have been implemented. And then maybe following up with, you know, evaluation questions. And I think sometimes um, 
you know, if that's going to show a change in your program, it's nice to have kind of a historical documentation of when you made those changes. Right. You know, it doesn't have to be elaborate, but just kind of even a running list because you're like, wow, the data really looks started to look different in this year. And so sometimes it's interesting to know what precipitated that change because it can be really hard to reconstruct it if you have, you know, a mature program that you've been operating year in, year out. So something to think about. Um, other folks on the call, I want to open this up. Are there burning evaluation issues that you want to discuss? Doesn't have to be a question, just something that's been on your mind. Hi there. <laughs> hey, Melanie. Um, yeah, I think we all know evaluations is tough. <laughs> um, so I'm from the Diversity Center of Santa Cruz County. Um, I've been in my role as uh, Director of Development and Communication since last August. And um, a year ago, the Diversity Center kind of revisioned, reassessed its mission and created a new direction. Um, and within that, our evaluations have evolved a lot. We serve the LGBTQ plus community and um, there's so much sensitivity. I'm sure this is so true across all different types of demographics, but there's so much sensitivity around serving the audience. Mm -hmm. um, one of the main things that takes a lot of our time is compiling all of the different survey requirements of our funders and making sure that um, there's no, I'm just gonna say it bluntly, transphobic, homophobic, um, exclusive exclusionary language. Mm -hmm. So interpreting language that maybe hasn't been looked at by the funder in five years, 10 years, um, and updating it to interpret it to our audience, um, and then reinterpreting it <laughs> to the funder. Mm -hmm. So that's one place where we get, um, where we end up having to spend a little bit more time um, is that kind of reinterpretation to ensure that our evaluations aren't harmful to the population we're mm -hmm. serving. Um, and then we also are really concerned with checking our biases that we have about our population. Um, so making sure that we are assessing our program, um, we are delivering on the outcomes or understanding the outcomes and that we are, you know, checking any biases that we might be entering with and kind of wanting to know what the true need is in the community because it evolves so much. So no specific question, but that's where I, we sit. <laughs> yeah, that, that can be really, um, yeah, it's such important. Those are important considerations and it can be really complicated. Um, you know, one of the thoughts I had when you were talking and some funders are more open to this than others, but I sometimes think it's really, um, can be like this, this gift or service that community-based organizations can play for funders to like educate them about some of those adjustments in language. I think that, that sometimes, you know, when people are, have distance, they don't necessarily aren't as aware of some of those nuances. So whether you've had any success with your funders and saying, you know, this question or this set of this kind of framing or this kind of, you know, response options just don't fit with our population, or maybe they're a little dated or, you know, whether there's any receptivity on the funder side um, to kind of making some adjustments to their their tools and their their requests. Yeah, we've definitely had uh, conversations like that with some of our kind of closest partners. Um, and we're in an evolution of always understanding the need and the change ourselves too. So it's definitely top of mind. I think um, in this kind of relaunch, we've been like sh a little bit shy and now we're seeing so much success that we're like, okay, we've been compliant. We've done a great job. Now let's explore how we can push this further for the benefit of both sides. Yeah, I think that's great. And the other thing that occurred to me is um, 
And again, I don't know how you're collecting data. I think sometimes, um, and I'm sure with sensitivity to language, but um, some of the work I found, I just recently did a participatory needs assessment um, with people living with HIV in the Detroit area. And so we really tried in our process to use a trauma-informed approach, both for our respondents, as well as the uh, individuals that were collecting data for us. And so I felt like that was really um, kind of enriched the process of creating like, you know, just uh, lots of space for individuals to respond or not respond to questions if they were, you know, uh, of just kind of really leaning into that, um, you know, creating trusting spaces, creating that option to opt out, making that really clear, or just taking a pause, um, and then kind of working with the individuals collecting the data in the same way, because sometimes collecting that data um, in this particular case was bringing up um, some past experiences that were needed, they needed to work through. So not that that's necessarily true of your population, but I think, you know, some of those sensitivities with just uh, a friend of mine once said, you know, it sometimes feels like we're dentists, you know, kind of just digging around in, in all these details of people's lives. And so kind of, um, you know, it's, it's great when there are organizations that are really sensitive to the needs of the people for whom, you know, that are providing information and, and data collection. So yeah, I think we're, we just, t the most simple way is we never want a, anybody to experience othering while they're in our care. And so like, how do we make sure that that extends to evaluations? And um, we actually did just start a new relationship with, um, with DataShare and they actually don't have a terrible amount of, of LGBTQ plus specific data, but they're working on it and their partners are working on it. And um, so we've encouraged them to to call us to help push that project forward as well. So there's there's horizon hope. There's horizon. <laughs> it's like ad advocacy through, uh, <laughs> through data collection in some ways. I don't know if that's quite right, but you know, I think um, too, like if it's just such a balance, like if you, if you can't if you don't have the tools to collect the data, like you can't necessarily lift up, you know, voices. Um, and so, um, yeah, kudos to you for kind of navigating that, that pretty, uh, like what can be a complicated um, space. Do other people have thoughts on that? Um, those topics Melanie shared? I don't think I have anything to add, but I do appreciate you bringing that into the conversation. It's really important. Thank you. <laughs> and the other thing, Melanie, if you have uh, particular tools, because I know that sometimes um, when we've been, uh, some of my work in Detroit, like at the, the trying to design a questionnaire and ask certain kinds of questions, um, you know, it can be kind of like really complicated or people are very hesitant to kind of say the wrong thing or ask things in the wrong way. So um, I, if you have tools that you like that are models of, you know, sensitive language um, that you, I don't know if there's anything out there that you would share any resources. Um, well, potentially um, in our partnership with DataShare, uh, we're kind of working on if we can do like a presentation um, that incorporates our LGBTQ plus uh, affirming and allyship training that we do for businesses and nonprofits. Um, so yeah. that's a that's a to come, hopefully. Nice. We also were able to partner with um, with a UCSC to get a um, graduate student researcher to further develop our evaluations, um, and so it's it's been a really great avenue for us to find someone who is queer identifying is a PhD candidate needs evaluations in order to go through this process of schooling. And we're able to kind of pull them over and benefit from that a little bit. So we've had to get super creative because none of us are really evaluation experts. Um, but we're trying to pull in as many identities and voices as we can. Um, so that we can kind of put together that toolkit and make it easier. That's Melanie, fantastic. I think it sounds brilliant. 
<laughs> We're <Really>? trying. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like there's a, a pure learning circle in your future. So <laughs> when you get through that next phase, that's fantastic. Thanks. Other, I have not looked at, oh, I was just checking the chat. Are there other um, topics that people are thinking about evaluation? data collection or any aspect of evaluation. <laughs> Are there things that people have done in terms of data collection that have worked really well for them? I feel like in addition to surveys, since we're in the realm of ed education, um, we don't like to call them evaluation or ob observations. We call them site visits. <laughs> but <laughs> but we we you know myself and all of our arts ed um, committee members and um, arts ed team members take turns and we go to visit um, programs in action. And we have a special form that we do use that um, really ensures that we're looking at all of the various different aspects of a, of a successful class um, and successful teaching. Um, so we do go in and kind of evaluate how things are going by observation. Um, and I feel like that has been really successful because we just see so many other nuanced um, things and factors in the classroom and, and th that we we just wouldn't get from our surveys and you can't build <laughs> that many questions into a survey um so I find you know that for for the purpose of education that's really helpful mm -hmm. so it sounds like you use a form and you go in and you you frame it as a site visit for your <laughs> Yeah, I always go in with my camera too, and I take lots of pictures, and it's always fun. But I'm also looking very carefully at, you know, how are the kids welcomed into the classroom? What is the first thing the teacher says to the students? You know, how what is the, what is the interaction between the teacher and the students look like? Is it comfortable? You know, are the kids all smiling and happy and having fun? You know, all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah. and is is that something that um, I'm curious? I, I've done some direct observations in in the past and framing is super important is it something but I feel like sometimes people can be really nervous like the teachers I don't know if they have is there anything that you do sometimes I think of it as like the evaluation anxiety or the observer anxiety are there things that you do to alleviate that a little bit or manage that yeah I mean I I feel like I naturally am pretty disarming like I typically I feel like people don't feel that scared of me at all. <laughs> scary. And like I said, I did, you know, I kind of frame it like I'm just here hanging out for the day and seeing how things are going. I'm here to support you really. Like ultimately I'm here because if there's something that's not working, I want to help you with it, you know, and I'll offer suggestions. And I always end up emailing afterwards saying how, you know, all the awesome things I saw. And if there is anything that I feel like needs a little help, I'll, I'll state that too and say, let's talk about, you know, your, your classroom management around this or whatever it is. Um, but I think, and I think the camera actually honestly helps with that a lot too. I'm just an amateur, you know, but I have a, a nice camera and, you know, it just, it takes, it, it takes the focus off me. Like they're watching. It's like, it's more like I'm there just to take some fun pictures. <laughs> um, and that seems to work really well. Yeah. So I really like that. I think that um, like that focus on the positive, you know, as well as, and then as a resource, it's not like I'm here to critique you, but it's like, you know, it's, it's, um, yeah, that additional support, because that's really what we want from evaluation, right? It's, um, but it, it can be a scary thing for a lot of sites uh, or, or people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't even use, like, we have a form, but I don't even bring it in now because I know it so well because I don't want them to see me sitting there like, writing things down to that point. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we had it, that... Um, 
And are you the only person who does that or do you have others that no, you've trained we have, I mean, to do our that? Arts, it's part of our arts ed committee um, role responsibility because we want them to be able to see things in action too. Um, so we do ask all of our arts ed committee members to go and do a site visit at least, I think it's twice a year now. So like sometime in the spring, sometime in the fall. So there are others that go in too. Um, but again, I, I feel like, um, yeah, the vibe... <laughs> The vibe isn't, it doesn't feel punitive. It doesn't feel um, uh, like we're there to assess how good the teacher's doing. Like, I think it, 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 the vibe, you know, I send out an email to all of our teaching artists and I've, you know, personal relationships with all of our teaching artists, but I do send out an email to all of them in advance saying, you know, these are the dates we're thinking about coming to visit your class. You know, these are the goals and this is why we're there. And I, I say you have to take pictures, <laughs> to see how it's going, to see if there's anything that's not working so well in case so we can help you and support you. <laughs> see, you know, see all the awesome that's happening so we can document it and share it with others. And then I think there's one other bullet point. I can't remember what it is, but I always like frame it um, in advance to that way. And I think that helps too. Yeah, I think that's all really lovely. Like it's it's transparent, you know, while you're there, but it's also really supportive. And then kind of that, um, I don't know, the relationship. And then the fact that you can also identify things that are opportunities for adjustment, improvement. You know, it's not like you're just <laughs> abandoning yeah. that purpose while you're you're kind of making it comfortable, but you're balancing those those multiple uh, perspectives. So that's that's fantastic. Okay. Other things about evaluation or data collection in particular, or any of those things to just. I'll just comment on. that the framing conversation is so important um, because uh, I think, you know, it extends like from like, nobody wants to take the census. Nobody just, no one wants to be evaluated. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, we all of our services are currently free, including mental health counseling. Mm -hmm. um, and so finding the right language to portray that we want to make sure that all of these resources are actively available and your participation in this means that more people are going to benefit from these types of services. So we've been really working hard as well on helping people not cold, cold surveying, but doing a little bit of kind of cultivation around evaluation culture um, mm -hmm. to help people be a little bit less afraid of it. And when you say people, are you thinking of obviously the program participants, but also staff a little bit? Is that yeah. part of the, the managing Definitely. their anxiety around <laughs> yeah, because, being evaluated? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm in development and in, I'm in communications. And so I'm like, feedback city like I doesn't harm me I know feedback has to happen but um, we have some younger staff members and some volunteers and interns and helping them you know if somebody's like why do I have to do this I hate this question and you know helping them know how to give reframe it give feedback take feedback and um, just improving the overall surveying culture to understand that ultimately it's going to benefit us. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So from the ground up adjusting the framing so that it doesn't feel as burdensome, but it actually is viewed as something that's like unlocking opportunity. Nice. Yeah, that's really nice. I think that, um, I mean, there's a whole field of people like evaluation anxiety. You could <laughs> Google it and there are articles about it. And um, I think, you know, it's both, um, for our participants, obviously, we want them to be able to, you know, talk to us about their circumstances, and we want them to be able to talk to us about our programs, but it's also for staff, and I think that that if, you know, that process isn't made kind of part of the culture or welcoming or safe, it can be really, um, well, there's all sorts of ripples of, you know, whether it's just people not feeling great about it to you don't get great data if people aren't invested and feel comfortable with the process. So super important to manage that. And it sounds like I, I love that like organizational culture around evaluation and learning. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left and I have a couple of 
slides that I can share, like some tips around things if we want to do that. And then if there are things that people just are like, wait a minute, we only have 10 minutes. We need a couple minutes at the end for housekeeping because we actually have a little survey to launch, <laughs> surprisingly. But um, I can move into sharing a couple slides with some of the tips on these last uh, data collection points. Although I think there have been so many more uh, in this conversation. And Crystal, I, I don't have you on screen in my little, in my, <laughs> uh, are, do you have things that you wanted to add or ask at this point? Are you good? I okay. don't, Jane. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, maybe we can just quickly go through these uh, screens and then I'll, I promise I won't. Um, so these were kind of the questions. Are there other things around that you would like to share that went really well or a challenge that you're facing um, that you'd like to discuss? Okay, um, if something comes to mind, just raise your hand. Um, and then, so we'll go on to the, just a few sort of, of sort of tips that I pulled together just from different articles in my own practice. So one of these is around staying disciplined to your evaluation questions. So really understanding what it is that you want to, want to know, um, and then, um, kind of avoiding that evaluation drift. I think my experience has been. Oftentimes people just will want, when they're looking at tools, they keep adding more and more questions. And mm -hmm. so you really want to make sure you're you're using your participants' time, the evaluation team's time wisely, and um, gathering the, that necessary information. Um, in terms of data collection, sequencing, and timing, you know, that might be the rhythm of your program and when you have most access to participants and when they have most time to... Um, participate in evaluation, you may also want to think about um, the timing of when you might need your uh, information, your data in order to include in funding reports. Um, I know sometimes like for educational programs, you may have, uh, your funder may have a certain fiscal year that doesn't coincide well with the academic year. And so, <clears throat> you know, you may need to think about that. You may need to provide um, some preliminary data, work with them, you know, when you can provide that final data. Um, so that's one piece. The other piece around sequencing might be around how you sequence the qualitative data that you collect or your observational data and then any kind of survey. So sometimes, you know, interviews, focus groups, observations might tell you kind of what are some of the emergent ideas. They might tell you what are good response options. And then that might help you de design a survey that can gather kind of how much, um, <clears throat> excuse me, my, my frog in my throat is back. <laughs> um, we talked a little bit about um, just staff and engaging them, making it safe, but also making sure they have time. Um, and they're great stakeholders to engage when you're planning and looking at your tools and those kinds of things. Um, other stakeholders as well on your data collection tools, whether those are some program participants that might agree to pilot um, tools for you or your processes. Um, it's nice if you can work that into your process to compensate people for their time. Um, if you have the resources to do that, whether it's in the pilot phase or in data collection phase. Um, there's a few more, there's lots of tips on these and you'll have the slides if you if you like them, but um, Again, thinking through, um, oh, yeah, the next one, uh, there we go, minimizing participant burden. So, you know, just kind of pairing those evaluation questions accordingly. Pilot testing, um, informed consent is a really good one to let participants know um, kind of why you're collecting data, um, that it's voluntary, they have the right to re refuse, um, it won't impact their service eligibility, um, whether they participate in the evaluation or not, or what kinds of feedback they give, um, potential risks and benefits to participating in an evaluation. Um, you know, with my group in Detroit that I mentioned, one of the risks was it may bring things up for people that are difficult. Um, benefit might be helping out the community in better understanding um, 
then whether the results are confidential or anonymous, are they, are people's names, can they be attached to them in some way? Or is it completely anonymous? Um, different programs, different funders have different requirements around this, but you also wanna make sure in that conversation, people know how their data will be kept secure, how long it's gonna be kept, when it will be destroyed, who has access to it, all those things. Um, and then, you know, how it might be used in reports if the information's aggregated or not made, um, you know, de-identified in any way. We talked about trust and bias as well. We talked a little bit about those secondary data sources at the beginning. Again, DataShare is a great resource and I love that it's also an educational resource. So that's really great. Uh, Melanie, I like the work that you're doing with them as well. Um, some other things around the next slide. And oops, we're getting to the end. So this last one, you know, you might want to look at your data periodically early just to see if there's anything weird in there. <laughs> like there may be errors in the data collection, or maybe there's a really vital program adjustment that needs to be made. Um, qualitative, working in time, qualitative data, that's really time consuming. And there's nothing sadder than data that's not used. <laughs> <laughs> And then um, I think the last thing that I would share is this piece around preliminary findings with your stakeholders, um, you know, kind of keeping people apprised at what's going on. You may want to share um, a little bit of findings before you kind of do that final report, um, mm -hmm. especially if there's something sensitive. Um, one of my early evaluation mentors said there should never be a surprise when somebody's reading an evaluation report, right? You should be communicating with your stakeholders as you go along um, with that. So um, I know we have to do some final things. So you'll get, there's a couple more odds and ends in these slides, but I'm gonna pass it back to, to Crystal to, to bring us home. Thanks, Jane. Do you wanna share more about the resources here? And then we can drop the links as well. Um, sure. So the six step model that is um, CDC has a lot of resources linked to that. Um, and it's just really a nice little manageable evaluation process. Um, some of the tips on trauma informed evaluation, they're from Wilder organization. That worksheet's a little bit old, but it's just nice and concise and has some good pieces in it. Not fully comprehensive, but it's rare to find it trauma informed information just about evaluation. Um, so I'd like that one. And then better evaluation um, is has got just links to everything. Um, they're great. And I also started a Padlet, um, but we'll get to that. <laughs> that'll come with, I, is there a follow-up to this? Or that'll be linked on the course site that has these and other resources. Oh. And if there are things people want to share um, on that Padlet, they can. Thank you. Yeah. Certainly, we'll send out the slides and resources with the meeting recording um, shortly after we're done today. Um, we just want to make sure you have on your calendar some upcoming events. And we also have a survey to share with you just with some feedback, if any, on the event today. Um, that's all we have for you. So we have one more peer learning circle with Jane later this month. It'll be on a Thursday from one to two. So a little bit different timing. And that will be on getting the most from your data and findings. And at the end of the month, we'll have a um, data share um, workshop with Nicole Young, Nicole Lezen, and the data share team using community indicators for planning and public policy practice with data share. And um, the link to those are on the core website, uh, core at uh, the events page of the website, excuse me. And Gisela just dropped that in the chat for you all. Very soon, we want to say we also have a larger survey coming out about the CORE Institute. So we wanted to just plant that seed for you all. Um, so please keep your eyes peeled um, for that. It'll, it should be coming out shortly in the next couple of weeks. Lastly, uh, Gisela also dropped the link to a brief feedback survey for the event today. If you have a moment to please fill that out, that would be so appreciated. Um, thank you all so much for your time today, and we hope to see you at the next Peer Learning Circle in a couple of weeks. Thank, thank you, and you. take great care. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.